We are Dave Philp and David Deutsch. And we're hanging out with David and Dave. That's where the theme music That was start. so well done. I got to yeah. say. That was awesome. Woo. That's really a fantastic opening credit sequence. I got to say, that was the best ever. We, we worked hard on that. We really um, need a theme song, and we need a band, and we need a live studio audience. There are a lot of things we could use. Uh -oh. Oops, excuse. I think I just like uh, I, I just clicked on something. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I'm still on the air. Oh, here I go. Here, 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 here. Oh, God, that was horrifying. Yeah. Well, that big face in our scene. Yeah. Well, hey, David, let's go right to the guest, and then we can say who we are. Okay, great. Our guest is Adam Carl, who has been a working actor since the age of 12, which was 30 years ago. God help him. With yes. most of his success coming from the age of 12 to 27. In adulthood, he transitioned into writing, producing, directing in the independent micro-budget film arena. He's made three films, none of which have really seen the light of day, but he's also worked in local Los Angeles theater as an actor and a director. He blogs about progressive politics, toils anonymously as a joke writer, which now he is no longer anonymous, mostly on Twitter <laughs> for websites like Witstream. He is a member of the Federal a Witness Protection Program, and his yeah. real name is Adam Carl. Adam, great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. If, uh, they, listen, I wrote that intro, and you said it verbatim, and I appreciate that. I, I appreciate your writing it. It saved us about four hours of, of time. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we got sound effects and everything. This is great. Yeah. yeah you guys didn't tell me this was so technologically advanced. Well, you know, nerds like me. Yeah, that's the Google Hangout for you. David Deutsch, introduce yourself, why don't you? Thank you very much, Mr. Philp. My name is David Deutsch. I run a company called Synergy Social. We do a social media strategy for clients who are frightened by Facebook, terrified of Twitter, or lost on LinkedIn. And I was once run over by a giant pig. And I am Dave Philp. I run a company called You Choose LLC. You can find us at myyouchoose.com. I also am wearing stuff in my hair. <laughs> Let us move directly into Adam Carl. <clears throat> hey, David, you, I know Adam is your good buddy. Can I ask the first question? Please, by all means. I should have said, may I? Uh, the very first question that I have, because it, it means a lot to me, Adam, because we're very similar in age. Yes. We're much older than David Deutsch. This is, is true. You were on Family Ties, I saw, on your imdb.com profile. Cool. Yes. Do you remember anything about that? I used to love that show. It was, a, I loved working on that show. Everyone, could, I, I was actually, I was only on, uh, I was on one episode, but it was a, it was a two-parter. It's a very special. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, had a lot of very dramatic uh, stuff in it. Uh, in, in the, um, in the episode I was in, uh, uh, the, the, the father on the show, Mike, played by Michael Gross, Stephen Keaton, uh, mm -hmm. his, his father dies. and They go back to the childhood home uh, uh, to help his mother, you know, put her affairs in order, and uh, there's a lot of flashbacks. I played the father as a small. I was the, in the flashbacks. I was young, young Stephen King. Oh wow! So yeah. The, the, what would be interesting if you, is if you got Michael Gross today sitting yeah. right next to you, and how close would you guys look? Yeah, or actually, we, Michael Gross when he was that age. We really looked nothing alike then or now. <laughs> right. But. You know, you know, it's uh, funny. It was, uh, I saw him. Um, my wife had a Lifetime TV movie on last night, on Sunday night, and there was Michael Gross playing the father of a very bad man who beats his wife, and she ended up stabbing him like 199 times. He was, or something. He was the bad guy? He, Michael Gross was just the father of the bad guy. Oh, the father of the bad guy. Which, which well, technically well, his genetics were bad. I guess we can assume it's probably his fault. You know, that the, the son it's completely his fault. He spoiled the child as a child. He, he was I, a terrible father. I loved Michael Gross as an actor. I thought he was, I mean, he's still obviously a working actor. I shouldn't talk about him like he's dead. Um, <laughs> but uh, I really thought he was hilarious. Like, I, he really, that, that character in particular really made me laugh on that show. Um, and I, uh, I wish I saw more of him. I think Tremors. Did you ever see him in Tremors? I did see him in Trump. I don't remember it very well, but I do remember seeing him in that. He and, um, what's her name? The country, Reba McIntyre were great together. They had That's very right. good chemistry. They right. were lab coats the whole time, actually. But uh, what I did, I had a great time working on that show. Uh, the entire cast like, couldn't have been nicer. 
important. I think I was actually working on it at the same time that Michael J. Fox was running back and forth filming that and Back to the Future at the same time. Wow. And like sort of like running back and forth between the two sets, like, you know, in a state of total, you know, exhaustion. Jeez. So I think everyone wants to know yeah. Justine Bateman. Like, I think that's a tip of everyone's tongue. You know, I, the, the sad thing is I don't really remember. It, you know, because I didn't really have a lot of interaction with the main cast because I wasn't, they weren't really in any of the scenes I was in because they were all flashbacks to like the 50s. Um, so, but so the, I mean, I, you know, just, just hanging out on the set the whole week, everyone was very nice to me. That's awesome. That, that, that's really awesome. But, you know, when, I, when you and I met when I was living in Southern California, I guess a couple of years yes. ago, uh, we yes. had the uh, dim sum. I told Dave about our dim sum story there. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. You and I have met? <laughs> boom, boom, boom. <laughs> this, is, this changes the whole evening. I don't know. No. All right, we got to go. Yes, I do remember that lovely. Uh, it, was a good, it was a good dim sum afternoon I spent with you. Yeah, so, so we, you, I was uh, talking with our mutual friend Jonathan Stone, who I think might be watching this, and we oh, were talking about how you were the voice of Donatello on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. Yes, that the story there. <laughs> Sorry. The story there is this is like the one thing, like this is the one credit that it turns out has sort of followed me into adult. Like the the in terms of like the conversations that I have with people about my life, Donatello comes up the most uh, because apparently the this Ninja Turtles thing has a following. Who knew? Who knew? Um, when I got that job, I really I was I was a little bit older already, so I didn't really I wasn't really into the whole turtles scene. I mean, I I I'd sort of heard of the phenomenon, but I wasn't watching. And I'm not a comic book guy, so I, I wasn't really into the, to the whole thing. And then uh, Corey Feldman had done the voice of Donatello in the first film. And then, uh, you know, Corey ran into some issues with law enforcement um, and perhaps some personal habits that did not uh, go over well with the folks at New Line Cinema. And uh, they decided that he maybe should not be uh, involved in the second film. So they decided to recast. And uh, I think they actually recast. They found someone else who I think did the job for like two days, and then they decided they didn't like that guy. And so they were sort of desperate to find anyone at that point that's like someone with a pulse. Uh, and so when I auditioned for it, I really didn't, I didn't, I hadn't seen the first movie. I didn't know what Corey sounded like. I didn't try to do, I didn't try to sound like him. I just sort of did my own thing. And they said, okay, great, you start tomorrow. Uh, so I just sort of like went in the next day and just sort of did the, like just sort of winged it, um, and I think that probably explains why in the third movie they brought Corey back. Uh, I think they uh, they actually hated me so much that they decided that the uh, that the uh, the heroine you know wasn't a big deal, and they brought him back. How did it feel in a big rubber suit? I actually was not in the suit. I was only the voice. Okay, uh, what was that so what, 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 tell us about what it's like to be uh, the the voice of Donatello. Uh, it was, it was, you know, it's fine. You're sitting, you're you're in the studio. You're, we, we actually uh, recorded it at uh, what was then uh, Skywalker Sound, uh, which is owned by George Lucas, uh, and was on. It was on the west side um, uh, of L.A. I don't even know if it, I don't think it's there anymore. Um, and it was this, you know, big, beautiful post-production sound facility. In fact, when we were there recording Ninja Turtles, uh, Oliver Stone was there at the same time mixing uh, the Doors movie. So there are all these big, you know, projects going on. Uh, is that actually? Do I actually see a poster of the movie down in the corner here? Is that yes, I, I, I. There it is. I, I put it up there for you. That's fantastic. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and literally, you know, like we were just, you know, we'd, we had our lines printed out. And we would stand at a microphone and, and actually watch the footage and try to match the words to, you know, the the lip movements on these on these big rubber, you know, turtles. Uh, unfortunately, there were sometimes more lip flaps than there were words. So they would sort of say, well, you know, at the end, of just, just add something, just kind of make a sound, you know, to, to make it match. So you'd kind of be like, you know, cowabunga, uh, uh, uh. Like, you know, let's just, like, add five syllables to it and make it match. Um, so it was a little bit, uh, it was a little bit interesting. But uh, it was fun. We, I did it completely by myself. The other turtles weren't there. I actually only worked with those guys like maybe two days at the very end, where they wanted to get some group stuff. Um, but for the most part, it was just by myself in a in a little you know on a little stage with a microphone, um, all by my lonesome. 
How, how did you find it about the uh, audition in the first place? You know, for everyone, aspiring actors out there who want to. Um, I actually had a a voice agent. I had an agent at the time that was solely for voiceover work, and I was doing a lot of uh, cartoon work at the time. Uh, so I was sort of in that that world, um, which is a very and, and remains a very sort of uh, uh, insular tight circle, that sort of voiceover world, and the, the guys who do it have been doing it for a long time, and they, they work constantly and go from, you know, session to session, you know, you know all day long. Um, I was very lucky in that I got into it when I was young enough where, you know, if you could read, <laughs> you were, you know, you might, you would probably work if you could, you know, cold read pretty well. Um, but now, the, as an adult, uh, the competition is just, is, the guys who do this for a living are really extraordinary, what they can do with their with their voices, and I'm, I'm just not at that level, unfortunately, anymore. But uh, I was able to do a lot of cartoon stuff when I was a kid. And according to IMDb, you're also, oh, sorry, Dave, you were, you were on Batman. I loved the Batman cartoon. I loved it, and I, I remember the episode you were on. Come on. I've got Batman in the baseball. I remember it. I, of course, it was a fantastic show. It was just that, yeah, I just sort of did like a little guest voice on that, on that one episode. And I, but I, do, I feel like that episode is sort of, is sort of widely reviled. I think if you look on the internet, I think people in particular, fans, uh, hated that episode. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting a yeah. sense of the, the theme here. I'm yeah. No. <laughs> Listen, I, I love nothing more than when I see, when I read things about Ninja Turtles 2 and people talk about how terrible I was. And that if they do a remake, they should definitely bring back Corey. It's, it's fun <laughs> to read that. In fact, in fact, the LA Weekly review came out of, of Ninja Turtles 2 at the time. And the LA Weekly review said... The critic said, uh, and it ended the review with, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but I actually missed the presence of Corey Feldman, the original Donatello. Oh. And I actually printed that out and blew it up and framed it and put it over my desk in my, in my office just to sort of, you know, keep me forever humble. But that was good. How old were you at the time when you did that film? I want to say I was like mm, 21, maybe. When you read that review, though, was at first were you like, oh, did it, like, kill you for a second, or you were good for, about yeah, it? Yeah, for one brief moment, it felt like someone had shoved a dagger in my heart, and then mm -hmm. I just thought it was funny. Because you know? <laughs> I could just imagine, like, the critics sitting around, like, just trying to come up with mean things to say about the movie, you know? And I, I got one, I'll praise Corey Feldman. <laughs> <laughs> the movie was boring to me. You know, I liked the first one very much, and the second one, I was just, it wasn't well, I think the problem with the second one is that they decided that they needed to... The first movie was darker. Yeah. And they decided that they needed to make it more family-friendly and sort of soften it. And so they gave us very specific direction about making the violence sound fun. Like, <laughs> keep it light and make it sound fun and don't get too intense with it. I said All that to right. Dave the other day, actually, as I was... He was, he was pounding my head into the... Uh, concrete keep it there. light? Yeah. Make it sound fun. Yeah. yeah. And so he uh, just kept going, boing, boing, zowie. <laughs> oh, we were having blood. I was blood, bleeding. Blood pouring down your face, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't, you know, I didn't, I wasn't a huge fan of the movie myself. I didn't really get it. It wasn't sort of my cup of tea, as it were. Um, but I think it ha it's one of those things that because so many uh, kids of a certain age saw it when they were at a very um, formative time in their lives, uh, they sort of, and I do that with movies from my childhood that I thought were so brilliantly funny or something, and then I see them years later and think, oh my god, I can't believe I really loved Oh Heavenly Dog, or, you know, you know whatever, whatever Chevy Chase movie I thought was funny when I was a kid. <laughs> um, they, you know, you take it with you and you sort of hold on to those things. So there's a lot of people in their, I guess, 30s who just still kind of, uh, kind of worship this movie and think it's fantastic. So far be it for me to burst their bubbles. Well, your credits... Are, are, are pretty cool when you go back. You know, you're, we're talking about uh, The Facts of Life, The, tr yeah. the Tracy Ullman Show, mm -hmm. Charles in Charge, and sure. Who's the Boss? Sure, Dear John. Sure. Life Goes On, The Corky Show, and right. Designing Women. That is pretty cool. It's, it's sort of weird. I honestly, a lot of times, go back, and if I, if I see my own sort of IMDb page, I, I, go, I sort of ask myself, like, was that... Was that me? Was this my life? Like, it seems sort of strange to me. And I think back on some of the... I mean, I was, I've been really, really lucky. And as a kid, I got to work with some amazing... Some, I mean, you know, legends as far as I'm concerned. You know, I got to work with, you know, Bob Newhart. And I got to work with John Ritter. Uh, and I got to work with, you know, with Michael J. Fox. And, and uh, I'm, you know, 
there were some that weren't legends. You know, I'm not going to say you know Scott Baio was a legend, but uh, but a lot of I, I really have just worked with some amazing people, people that I sort of have worshipped my entire life. So thinking back on that, like I have to say, pretty cool. And Willie Ames, I think. And Willie Ames, absolutely. Pretty Willie major. Ames, who, by the way, was the answer in uh, the Sunday crossword puzzle, uh, I believe 89 across the other day, the answer was Willie Ames. I saw I that, know, yeah. It sort of depressed me a little bit. <laughs> I, I had that. You Actually, didn't know that? I knew that, yeah. No, it just made me a little bit sad. Like, <laughs> Willie Ames is in a cross I've never been a clue in a crossword puzzle, but Willie Ames manages to be. <laughs> and by the way, Bayo was in that same crossword, so I don't know what's going on with that crossword puzzle writer, but clearly, huge Charles and George fan, yeah, or, or a fan of the movie Zapped, one of the two. I don't know. But definitely not Joni Loves Chachi. No, because Willie yeah. Ames was not on Joni Loves Chachi, as well, far as I know. Well, you, you you look back at all this stuff from '84 through '91, '92, you know '93. You were working really steadily. And you, you mentioned you know, you worked with all these great actors, had all these really good credits. They all look like, you know, one-offs, you know, you were in one episode of this, one episode of that kind of right. thing. Um, as you're, you were getting older, were you, were you thinking, you know, where's my big break? When am I going to get seen to be in that movie? And am I going to be able to make a living for the rest of my life doing this? What were you thinking? Or were you not thinking at all like that, just going along for the uh, ride? Well, I think it's clear that I just don't think much at all. Um, but I, when I was, it's funny, when I was younger, I was, I was sort of the kid equivalent of a character actor. Uh, mm -hmm. which I loved because I, I got to work on a lot of different projects. I never had that pressure of it being sort of my thing because I never had like huge success like some of these, you know, kids who were, you know, teen idols like, like Corey. I didn't have that kind of pressure on me. Um, and so I feel like I probably sort of made it through my childhood and adolescence, you know, a little bit smoother because of that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it also helped that I had very grounded parents and who, you know, the, I remember when I was a kid, the first thing my parents said to me when I decided I wanted to do this, they didn't know what the hell I was talking about or why I wanted to do this. And they were not pushing me at all. Uh, but they saw how serious I was about it. And they said to me, the day this becomes more fun for us than it is for you, you're done. Which I thought was probably the greatest thing they could have possibly said to me. Mm -hmm. Um so I, you know, I sort of enjoyed having that kind of div the little diverse career, um, and I think I worked a lot, not so much because I was particularly talented, because I really don't think that I was. Um, I think I had a, a good, a marketable look for a kid, because I, let's call it the Jewish nerd look. Uh, I think that was very uh, marketable at the time, and uh, and I could, and I was sort of a, uh, you know, a, a precocious reader. I was reading from a very early age. Um, and I sort of, I could read a script, I could cold read a script in an audition and sort of immediately get, you know, what the writer's intent was without having to be coached by a grown-up. So I think that that helped me sort of get jobs because I auditioned well. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it necessarily really translated to me being particularly talented. I know there were a lot of kid actors that I saw that were my contemporaries who I thought were far more classically talented actors than I was and, and remain so, and a lot of them are still working because of it. Um, but I did think that I was going to continue to to work. I never thought that I was going to have some huge that I was ever going to be some big famous you know actor who was sort of you know front you know the lead in a movie or the lead on a show. But I did think I would continue to have sort of these supporting and guest roles on things. Um, and I was a little bit surprised. <laughs> I think I was probably a little bit surprised when when the work started to dry up. And why why do you think that is? What do you think what happened? Um, well, you know, when you're, you're young and I was, when I was young and, and, and precocious, that was one thing. Uh, but when you get to be a grown-up, uh, the competition, I think, becomes much more intense. You have, you know, you're dealing with a much bigger pool of actors when you're a grown-up than when you're a kid. Um, and they're extraordinarily talented, the ones who, you know, by and large are, are getting work. Um, and so it just, it, just becomes more, it just becomes more difficult to sustain that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think on top of that, there were also mistakes I made. Uh, I think if I had continued along a certain path when I was younger, um, if I had done a better job of uh, maintaining my contacts, if I had done a better job of marketing myself, if I hadn't decided that I needed to grow my hair out and be, you know, and be a long-haired musician type instead of a nerdy Jewish type, you know, all these things that you're... You know, listen, when you're a teenager, 
<laughs> you uh, you make a lot of stupid decisions, and you think that you know this is going to last forever. Yeah. Um, and so there was, I think, a certain amount of arrogance on my part that I could sort of just do whatever, and that it, the work would continue. And uh, it turns out I was wrong. <laughs> is this you? That is, is me. That's that is you, right that there. Is, that is you. That is actually a still photo from. I remember uh, ABC used to do. That, uh, you're very. You guys are great. Um, the research staff is fantastic on your show. Yeah. Um, we pay a, a number of people, by the way. Our budget for uh, interns <laughs> is, is huge. That's right. There was a uh, ABC used to do a thing called. It was the Disney Sunday movie. Um, I, and I did like th like three of them, and that one was one called Bigfoot. Uh, and that was like a still photo, still frame grab from that from that fine <laughs> film. Uh, That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So I remember you put out a movie called Waiting for Ophelia. Is that, is yes. that what it's called? Waiting for Ophelia. That is correct. And with uh, with uh, Yardley Smith from it was the voice of Lisa Simpson from The Simpsons. That is correct. The the Emmy Award winning voice of Lisa Simpson, Yardley Smith. That's right. Know. That's right. You worked with her. Yeah. How'd you get to know her? What's she like? Uh, she is one of my favorite human beings on the planet. Um, I actually, I actually directed a play um, at uh, a theater called the Falcon Theater in Toluca Lake, which is owned by Gary Marshall, um, the director of you know Pretty Woman and Valentine's Day, and the creator of Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley. Um, and he owns the theater, and I got a job directing a play there. It was a two-character play, and she was one of the uh, the actors. And I actually tried to talk the producer of the play out of hiring me. Uh, because I said, uh, listen, I've only directed plays like with my friends. Things that I wrote, things that just me and my friends were doing. I, any real actor who's been doing this for a long period of time is going to see right through me and know that I'm a complete and total fraud. Uh, and they'll probably quit. And you really don't want to hire me. But they were, they were really desperate and had to start rehearsals the next day because their initial director had dropped out. So the producer just talked me into taking the job and said, "Don't worry, you know, we'll, we'll, we got your back. We'll just tell them that, you know, we'll tell them that, that Gary's mentoring you. Don't worry about it. They'll be nice to you." So I was absolutely terrified and started rehearsals on this play and just faked it and pretended like I knew what I was doing. And it turns out that the two actors were really nice to me, and Yardley was one of them, and we just became became fast friends. Awesome. And so then when I I had, I had done my own play. Waiting for Ophelia was originally a play that I had written and done in town on a very small scale, and I had written sort of a, a movie version of it in the hopes of doing a little, you know, micro-budget film, and she asked to read the script, and I, I gave it to her with absolutely no expectations whatsoever, and she said, well, let's do this then. So we, she financed it and produced it, and, uh, and I produced it with her, and, and we made this little micro-budget movie version of this play. So essentially, it's, you know, Five actors sitting on a couch talking, which is very cinematic, and uh, really, we we should have we honestly should have shot it in like seventy millimeter cinemascope kind of thing because really it was epic, big epic couch, you know. That's awesome. Yeah. And we took it to a couple of film festivals, and uh, and we you know made a thousand DVDs, and you know I figured listen if I have a bunch of Facebook friends if I could just sell to like ten percent of them I'll sell you know five hundred copies. Didn't work. Didn't work. Didn't work. I think I sold, you know, 30. Oh, geez. The problem is that, you know, the, the tools of making films now are so accessible to so many people. And especially in L.A., you know, everyone knows someone who's made a movie. It's just not that, uh, it's just not that exciting and impressive anymore. Oh, and by the way, uh, Adam here is our furthest guest yet. He's an orange cat. You're in L.A. right now, or is that right? I'm, at the, the, I'm sitting, I'm actually at my mom's in Orange County, at at the moment, right, right, uh, County, California. Yes, so he's our fur he's our furthest guest yet. Wow, where are you? People are usually closer to Jersey, or are you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Usually they're usually they're on David's lap. Actually, <laughs> they don't speak English, yeah, but uh, they look good on camera. Yes. So I'm also the I'm also the least expensive guest you've had too, because I'm you know. <laughs> and your your accent is really pleasant to hear. You're a bargain. You're a bargain. As we say here in New, in New Jersey, you're a bargain. Excellent. Excellent. That's what I strive to be. What's, what's next? Oh, go, sorry, Dave, go ahead. No, no, I was, I was just going to say, um, I know you're doing a number of things now. Like, one, Could you tell us about Witstream? 
A absolutely. Witstream is a, a website that was started by um, a delightful and uh, hilarious woman named Lisa Cohen and Michael Ian Black, uh, who you may know is an actor and a stand-up comic. And they started this the, the web website, Witstream, to basically be a curated Twitter feed so that they were, they were sort of identifying uh, and, and creating relationships with uh, sort of the funniest people on Twitter. Uh, stand-up comics, writers, um, performers of all ilks, um, and getting them to uh, allow them to curate their Twitter feeds. And so if you go to Witstream, you're, you're seeing the best of the best, um, the cream of the Twitter comic crop, as it were. Um, I, I saw the one today It said, as my grandmother always says, what? I thought that just cracked me up. I don't know why. That just made me laugh. Which stream is great, and you'll see, like on their homepage, their their um, their algorithms will pick up, you know, keywords uh, without even having to have hashtags. So we can all comment on certain, you know, current events, whether it's the inauguration, whether it's the Golden Globes, um, the Oscars will be coming up, and so there's a lot of live tweeting of events, and. Um, so the Witstream has actually struck up strategic partnerships with other websites like uh, Splitsider and TV.com, the Huffington Post, um, and uh, so there's a lot of uh, outlets for our material to get seen. That's awesome. Yeah. And what do you do for them? Do you tweet for them? Or I, just, I just all I have to do, and they, it's all set up so that all I have to do is tweet, and my 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 tweets will immediately go to the Witstream site. Awesome. Um, and, and all you're, you're, the comments are. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Now, the comics are known as, as uh, aristocrats, which I think is great. And uh, we, uh, we all have our little profile page. And, uh, and it's great. It's just a great, it's just another way of, of getting, you know, getting your material out there, getting your work seen. Um, what's, your, what's your Twitter handle for everyone out there? Uh, I am Adam Wears Pants. Adam Wears Pants. And I, 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 I like the irony of it because it was a lie. Oh, I'm actually not wearing pants right now. Oh dear. Sorry. Uh, but the good news is I'm not on your lap. So okay, well, there's that. That's great news. Yeah, I I so. At least no, I'm not even gonna go there. This is a family friendly hangout, so I'm right. not gonna go there. But but Lisa's done a fantastic job with the site and I think it's uh, I just think it's great. So I'm really really pleased to be uh, a contributing member. And, and Adam's Twitter feed is very, very funny. And uh, we're, we're Facebook yeah. friends for a while. And really great I content. That. I really, and, and you get a lot of people liking and sharing. Your well, content. sometimes it just, you know, I'm glad to hear that because sometimes it just feels like you're sort of, you know, spitting into the wind. And uh, it's hard to remember sometimes that there's actually occasionally someone out there paying attention. So that's good. They do. No, even if they don't comment, I've noticed people make I, I hemorrhage followers every day. It's fantastic. I'm just constantly losing people left and right. <laughs> do you respond much? Do people uh, reply to your tweets? Not that much, and I, I think that part of it is that I really need to sort of get more in. I mean, the last thing I really need to do is to get more into social media because I waste most of my day on Facebook and Twitter as it is. Um, but I think I, I could probably do a better job of sort of internal Twitter networking, whatever that is, of sort of keeping in constant contact with the you know the people that are other writers, other comics, you know, etc. Um, there's a little core group that I sort of have a little back and forth banter with, but uh, I, sh I, should, I could probably do a better job of spreading that wider. So, so I mean, it's, it, I don't mean to, well, we're interviewing you, so it is going to be kind of personal. So, like, what, what, like, what do you do now to make money? Like, you're, you're in L.A., you're making micro movies that apparently are very small. That is a, that's a fantastic question. The good news is that because of the fiscal cliff negotiations, uh, federal unemployment benefits have been extended. So <laughs> that is something that I am really delighted by. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm just kind of like an unemployed asshole. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's why I'm very excited about the inauguration today. Um, no, I mean, I, uh, uh, I'm just another unemployed asshole, you know? Um, I'm just a guy trying to, you know, still make a living in production, and it's tough because there's just a lot of, a lot of the stuff that's out there is reality-based stuff now. Um, a lot of the people who are working those freelance production jobs are people with a lot more 
a lot more producing experience than I have in television, a lot more um, editing experience than I have. So, um, you know, the jobs are, the job market's a little thin, you know. Um, but I've just, you know, I've done some freelance producing where I was, um, I uh, spent a, the last year I worked on the reboot of, um, I don't know if you guys remember the show Pop-Up Video from the 90s. On yeah. VH1, right. For VH1. We did a, we did a reboot, the original production company did a reboot of the show and we were on for two seasons and so I worked as a, as a producer on that, um, which was a, a fantastic job and a great show. Um, uh, it was particularly great for me because I have the musical taste of an 80-year-old man. Uh, so uh, before taking the job, I had absolutely no idea who anybody modern was. And now I can actually go to a wedding and like hear the songs the DJ is playing and actually know them. So I'm feeling very hip. <laughs> you know, took about 10 years off my life. Uh, awesome. Like I actually saw Beyonce today sing uh, the national anthem and I knew who Beyonce was. So I was very proud of myself. Um, so, but just just taking freelance gigs uh, where I can, and writing, and you know, hoping that the next micro budget, <laughs> the next micro budget feature, turns out to be a shocking success. Is is that um, somebody asked me this question the other day, and I thought it was interesting. Like the end game, like do you have a strategy so that five years from now, ten years from now, you're not in the same place, or would you be comfortable? Be I mean, you're unemployed, so that um, sucks. But I, I actually don't have a strategy, and it causes me an enormous amount of uh, stress and anxiety on a daily basis. Um, because I really, honestly, I didn't think that this is where I was going to be at age four. I'm going to be 42 on Sunday. And I certainly thought that I was going to be much further along in my life and career uh, than I am. Um, and, you know, I had some great success early. Um, I also made some really stupid mistakes, like taking my life savings, and I actually financed my first feature that I made, that I directed in '96. Uh, I spent all my own money on it. I cashed in the 401, you know, the the IRA, all the money my parents had been socking away for me that I had made as a kid, and I spent it all making a movie, thinking as long as I finish this thing, of course I'm going to sell it and I'll make my money back. Um, and, and it was around the time that that the indie film world was just exploding. You know, uh, Robert Townsend had made Hollywood shuffle on his credit cards. It was a fantastic story. It made a shitload of money. He became, you know, famous for a little while. And uh, everyone thought, oh, if we just make a movie, you know, we'll, we'll be the next Robert Townsend. But it turns out that you can actually make a movie, spend all your money, and have nobody give a shit about it. <laughs> they don't tell you that part. Um, so, you know, there's, there were some key mistakes along the way. Um... Uh, in retrospect, I might not have wanted to spend <laughs> spend my own money making a film, um, but you know that's the stuff I guess you're supposed to do when you're young and stupid, uh, and you figure you have the rest of your life to you know for a do over. Um, but you know, I, so I think I thought I'd be further along than I am. Um, I don't, you know, it's it's a scary world out there. The economy is still really you know precarious. Um, I really don't know where I'm going to be in five years. Um, and it terrifies me, but at the same time, like, it's kind of exciting. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really mind not knowing, as long as the answer isn't that I'm going to be, you know, pushing a shopping cart down Fairfax, muttering about socialism, you know, then I think that I'll be okay. You know. I oh, think. that's awesome. That's awesome. Fairfax, yes, I remember Fairfax. Sorry, I'm making, I'm making region, local regional references, which I probably shouldn't do. Yeah, no, it's, I, remember, I remember Fairfax, sure, of course. Uh, the, my uh, favorite breakfast place is on Sunset in Fairfax, the, uh, the griddle. The great thing about Fairfax is that there were homeless people on Fairfax, but they were all Jews, which was fantastic. And we would call it the Bagel Belt, because it was all, you know, very, there was a very uh, strong uh, Hasidic Jewish community there. Um, it's a very, it's, there's a lot, you know, delis, Cantor's Deli, there's a lot of, you know, yeah. so you, you had you the, the, the Jewish homeless. Yeah. One, of, one of my favorite things to do in L.A. was on Friday nights at around 5 o'clock, most people start, you know, getting ready to go out. I went to the Trader Joe's in the 3rd and La Brea, and I watched the uh, Hasidic Jews get all panicky as the sun went down, trying to get out of, uh, out of the uh, grocery store before the sun went what? down. Listen, I get panicky just trying to get out of their parking lot. So yeah, I it's a horrible parking lot. Horrible but parking lot. They can't use any electronics after on, on Sabbath. And so I, I have to say the 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 I I'm a very you know I consider myself to be a very you know tolerant person, tolerant of all people, faiths, and walks of life. 
but I, I find myself that I, there's a certain annoyance I get when I see the Hasidic Jews yeah, on a 110 degree day in Los Angeles with the big ridiculous big, fur big, hat big, exactly. and I just want to like roll down my window and scream at them you're not in Siberia anymore like that's why you wore the hat it, you know you're not in exile on the road of shackles like it's okay you can wear a little beanie or something. That's right. It's okay. Drives me nuts. No. I feel, I feel you. I'm the same way. Yeah. I'm Methodist, but I'm like that with the Amish. <laughs> you know, you're not you're not in Siberia anymore, you guys. You it's know? Easy, it's easy to be frustrated with the Amish. Yeah. I just see the difference sometimes. It's like, are you Amish or are you Jewish? Yeah. Have you guys the Amish can't use other horse and buggies after Sabbath begins. So. Right. And, <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the Jews actually have the horse and buggy concession. So that's sort of, the, I think, the difference between the two, <laughs> the two things. Um, have you seen that reality show with the Amish? I don't understand this. It seems like it's very... Stupid. Yeah, stupid. <laughs> but yeah. it's like they're like an Amish mafia or something. What's, what's going on there? Oh, well, there, there, there's two, wasn't there? There was a, I saw an Amish mafia. But then there's the Amish uh, kids who, like, go to the big city. Like on Rumspringa, that kind of thing. Like they have their little break and they get to go. Yeah, I'm like speaking. I'm speaking gibberish now, but Rumspringa means spring of break, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. They have their little break where they don't have to be Amish for like five seconds. <laughs> right. It's weird. Yeah. Not right. me. I have no idea. I have yeah, no I don't idea. know. This this really gotten a little far afield here. Yes, it's all good. Well, David, ask your final question that you usually ask at the finality of these things. So, my final question, if a train leaves Chicago at 5 a.m. <laughs> heading east, The answer pen. is, get a pen. The, doctor, the doctor was a woman. <laughs> that is the answer to that the, question. The, the, the question I'd like to ask is, what yeah. lessons can you teach us? What wisdom have oh, you learned? Jesus, age, Christ, on a popsicle stick. Are you kidding me? What lessons can I teach you? Yes, I'm kidding. I'm just joking. I've, I've got nothing. <laughs> Uh, don't spend your own money making a movie. That's one lesson, you know. Don't be an idiot teenager. That's another lesson. Um, I think it's t I, uh, honestly, I think it's tough. I think because the the lessons that I learned as a young person, I think are lessons that kind of have to be learned by a young person. Yeah. Um, nobody can tell you anything when you're that age. You really think you you know everything. You don't trust anyone over thirty. Nobody else gets it, and you're a genius. And then you get to be my age now and realize, oh no, that, that actually those people had my best interest at heart and they knew what they were talking about and I'm the asshole. Um, so I don't know that you can really, you can try to sort of impress those kinds of things on young people now, like, you know, learn from the mistakes I made and don't make the same mistakes, but I don't know that that, that they would listen because, you know, their brains aren't fully formed yet, yeah, so yeah. it's hard to. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, that's a tough one. What lessons can you teach me, Dave? Me, I got nothing. Nothing, I Dave. How about you? Anyone? Anything? Um, hola in Spanish means "Yo, what's up." Oh. All right, all right. Yeah, so I've learned. I've learned something. Oh, let me make a note of that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I've learned that you know, Deutsch likes you know, people to sit on his lap. I learned that tonight. That's important. Uh, you know, I, I learned a little bit about New Jersey before we start. Before we went live, I was getting a little New Jersey info from from David. So. Yeah. I had some families from Morristown, actually. Originally. I had some family that was in Morristown. It's true. My my family was in York, Pennsylvania, prior to moving out here. Mm -hmm. I was the first one of my family to be born uh, in California, so I'm first generation. <laughs> right, right off not the boat, but I guess the the Buick. Right, right, yes, right, yes, right out of right. a kind right of boat, of, I guess. My, right out of my father's Ford Maverick. <laughs> Dave Phelps, any final questions for uh, Adam Carl? I got nothing. There, now the three of us have said it. That's fantastic. Right. Carl, I actually prefer that. So, uh, David, we should have uh, Adam on again sometime in the next I, six months. I think that would be awesome. That would be delightful. I would be uh, happy to come back, happy to discuss something other than myself. You know, I would, you know, things about the outside world would be great. We're here to ask you about you. That's why we well, brought I mean, you on. I don't, I don't love the navel gazing, but you know, I'm yes, happy to help in any way that yes, I can. Come on, come I mean, on, you do. There's a lot of lint in there. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> David, when something big happens in the world, we'll we'll just go over to Adam and get his take on it. Please, exactly. that I would love to pontificate about big things in the world. Yeah. Um, 
we can. Uh, but in meanwhile, check out his Twitter feed at Adam Wears Pants. Adam Wears Pants. That is correct. Really, really funny stuff on Twitter. Check out Witchstream.com. W i t s t r e a m dot com. You see all the wittiest people on Twitter. What well, else? Most of them far wittier than I. And what what else can we promote for you? What else do you need? Uh, how, about, how about saveadamcarl dot com? <laughs> that was actually a website. My friend, I think it's defunct now. A friend Jonathan? of mine actually had put that up there uh, to try to get me a job at one point. That was Jonathan, wasn't it? Jonathan Stone. No, it was a different a different friend of mine. My friend Jason, who's a, a web designer. Oh, okay. Uh, but it, it's, it's still uh, there. Actually, I got, listen, I got the pop-up video job shortly thereafter, so clearly it worked. Maybe this I will do something for you, too. Yeah. That's it, right there. Nice. There we go. Yeah. They're working. And maybe the world. That's right. All I'm saying. Yeah. So, all right, let's end this on Growing Board. Okay. So, for hanging out with David plus Dave, I'm Dave. And I'm David. And that's Adam. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.